I would ask the presenters to join me on stage now. Unfortunately, there seems to be an issue with a robot connecting our discussant of the University of Ghana. That leaves us more time to discuss here in the room. So um, as uh, the presenters are joining us, um, any immediate questions, concerns here in the room on the presentations, but also in terms of uh, already picking up some of the homework that Annalena left us with, basically. <laughs> Please raise your hand, and then we have mics in the room. Mine is not so much a question, but just a couple of observations to, to stress the relevance of this type of work. Um, I mean, two observations. Uh, one is that this links um, uh, very much back to uh, a discussion that Martin Rebellion has been, been quite sort of uh, strongly discussing over the years and taken uh, somewhat uh, strong views on. So I think it, it will be kind of relevant uh, in, in relation to this to sort of make sure that it's linked back uh, to his arguments and so on. And, and, and this is just observation. I haven't had the chance to read the paper, so this is potentially already in there. But, but it will be kind of interesting to hear whether you have any reflections on his rather strong recommendations and why he did that, and then uh, the results or recommendations that you're coming up with. Uh, the other observation is that we've, we've just been going through the corona crisis and uh, when one does a uh, very careful analysis of uh, corona responses or measures taken due to the corona and try to compare low-income African countries uh, with other countries in the world, um, there, I mean, there are basically two extremely interesting uh, things that stand out uh, in terms of uh, w where do the differences lie. African countries in general did exactly the same sets of measures that the developed world. When you go through, um, I mean, control of movements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all of that looks very much the same. But there are two very different things. One is the capacity of the public sector to respond because of fiscal constraints. And the other one uh, <clears throat> is the long-term consequences of the inability to respond. I mean, those two things are essentially the key differences between the African continent and the rest of the world. And that, of course, stresses the relevance of the kind of work um, uh, that you're doing. And it suggests, for example, a reference to uh, Yuka's point, where is it that the African countries really are uh, in, in terms of uh, this sort of thing. So maybe I would sort of <laughs> suggest that that's brought out clearly that actually we are finding the African countries up here rather than down here to, to get that message across because it is so fundamental in our policy discussions and, and thinking about the implications of this work. But those were maybe more comments, but thank you. Thank you, Fen. We, we take Pekka and then you get a chance. <clears throat> yes, I'm Pekka Seppala, coming from foreign ministry, so from aid world more than research world currently. Thank you for presentations. They're very nicely complementing to each other, uh, getting from technical targeting towards, towards this more political uh, sphere in Anna Le Lena's presentation. Um, just one observation for this, Yuka Anna Adnan's. Uh, uh, paper is question on, on, on data. I remember that uh, in Ethiopia the latest poverty data is from 2016. So what kind of uh, uh, data sets you can use um, uh, to get the sort of a, uh, national, national uh, uh, coverage. And, and that somehow relates to Michael, Michael's paper on uh, because in, in aid, if you look at the Ethiopian case, you have an interesting, you have, a, you have like about 20 million poor people, but then you have um, like 5 million internally displaced people and, and many million refugees from other countries. So in addition to the normal poor, supported by social protection schemes, uh, and which are supported by a, a normal aid. There is um, humanitarian aid targeting differently 
uh, different sets of people which are partly overlapping. So my, my question is that you have studied the, the, the uh, official development cooperation impacts. Do you also have uh, located in some of these countries separately the, the, the impact of, 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 of humanitarian measures? Um, is, is that somehow included? Yeah, and uh, Annalena's paper was a very nice um, on, on this over-targeting uh, politics, uh, under-targeting. I'm always wondering myself about the seasonality of poverty and whether these protection schemes could be seasonally uh, 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 sort of um, uh, uh, distributed and whether that, that has been uh, an analyzed in any, any of the studies that you have come across. Because that could be, if you, feel, if you think about the effectiveness uh, in rural food deficit households, so that could be definitely an important um, way of, of, of um, uh, creating. It's not a kind of a targeting, but kind of a distribution uh, method. So it, has that seasonality ever been sort of located as a distribution method uh, issue? Thank you. Okay, so thank you. So uh, I just want to pick up on the, on the last point that Finn, Finn raised, that the, uh, yeah, the capacity to respond and the long-term long -term consequences. And in fact, the, I mean, uh, one interesting case study uh, uh, and the, uh, in the African continent, on the African continent, uh, is South Africa, which is by no means, of course, I mean, uh, 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 a typical African country. But the, um, for the first time during the pandemic, um, uh, in my understanding, and, and now my South African colleagues can, can correct me, uh, the, the country provided um, uh, cash transfers to the, uh, uh, to the working age population who, who, who wouldn't be eligible for the unemployment um, uh, uh, benefit. And, and the eligibility conditions for that are quite, quite stringent. So, I mean, it, this, this meant a major change in the, in the social protection um, environment. And the long-term consequence of that is been this ongoing discussion on, on whether that should be a permanent solution to, to have support for. And I see... A, do I see Ayanda in the, in the audience, so maybe, maybe she wants to weigh in here, I mean, what, what the current policy discussion there is. Uh, but maybe this is a sil silver lining of the, um, of, of the crisis, that this can, 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 can act as a catalyst. I mean, of course, there were issues in, in terms of the uh, uh, delivery of these, these transfers, etc. So, so that also highlights your point. And then, then, of course, there's the fiscal sustainability issue. Uh, so, so, so in that respect, the crisis was interesting, and, uh, and then some analysis done by the Saspir colleagues actually showed that the, at the height of the crisis, because of these transfers to the very bottom of the distribution, their incomes actually increased during the crisis in comparison to, to the pre-crisis situation. So, the, so the system more than more than compensated for that, and it was not because these, these transfers would have been very large. It, it was just because their incomes, to begin with, were close to zero. So then the relative change is, is, is pretty large. Adnan, do you want to uh, comment on the data? Yes. I will uh, address the question regarding the data. Yeah, there's two broad surveys in Ethiopia. The main one is a social household consumption survey, which, which was re uh, recently administered in 2020. But the official uh, poverty line is computing using the earlier version of the survey, which, uh, which is 2061. But for ET mode, uh, we want also other variables, income and demographic variable. So this household consumption survey doesn't cover uh, other variables um, other than uh, consumption and uh, welfare uh, variables. So we use the survey which jointly administers by Ethiopian uh, uh, Statistics Office and World Bank, the survey called Ethiopian Social Economic Survey. So this survey uh, ha administered usually once in two years. So the recent one is 2021 wave. So we use the uh, uh, absolute poverty line from 2060 survey, and then we inflated to 
to 2020 in order to measure uh, the effect of the crisis on the poverty. And thank you. Well, thank you. Um, it's, I think it's working. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so, so for the comments. Um, so I will try to link uh, the, the comments by, by Fina and our colleague. Um, in relation to, uh, to crisis, for example, we, what we know from, from COVID, which is the, the last major shock that the globe has faced, uh, there were about uh, 3,000 responses to mitigate the effect of COVID globally in terms of the area of social protection. After 12 months, just about 20% of the programs remains in place. You know? so, which also speaks to two uh, at least overall things. One is the financial uh, requirements to sustain these programs beyond the crisis period. And the other one, the institutional ability to uh, also maintain these kind of policies. Um, so what we know, the, the importance of these systems really reflect the fact that if you think about what um, we don't have sufficient data to look at the effect of COVID substantially in, in this context, probably in a couple of years we will be able to do it. But in relation to previous uh, crises like uh, the financial crisis of 2008 and nine, we know that primarily middle income countries who had social protection systems in place at that time were the ones able to absorb the financial assistance by international um, agencies to mitigate the effect of this. Uh, of the shocks, you know, as contracyclical measures. Many countries that didn't have those systems were unable to actually capture those resources available by multilaterals and also development banks. So this also underscores the importance of building these institutions, but also again connects to the issue of, of the fiscal space that so, uh, Yuka was referring to. You know? So there's an issue of a connection in this area. So, and in, in terms of the humanitarian assistance, I think this is a, a very a, a relevant point, uh, the way uh, certain countries are facing uh, displaced populations uh, also reflect uh, an attention. Usually if you look at the data by, you know, population data, I use, you know, uh, data that reflect population and also aid. We can capture uh, assistance to humanitarian responses, but in the data of population, many of the displaced populations are not captured. So we will need to do um, a, a, an additional work to actually look at this. But it, this is a, a very important point, thanks. Annalena. Um, I, would, I would say a more of a big picture thing is I can't um, speak to the technicalities in as much as you can, but um, I mean, I really appreciate also the comment on, on seasonality. I think it's what I was trying also to say with um, adaptive social protection, which is learning from um, climate change, early warning systems and so forth. Um, I think what I what I would like to stress really is like okay uh, after and I was talking with um, Miguel about this um, I haven't been in the social protection space for very long, but it's the the kind of debates seem to be coming back to the same points. I think what we were talking about in 2012 uh, uh, or what we were talking out about after the crisis, even for me, sounded very familiar. Um, and it was a moment where I was a bit surprised, to be honest. Um, so I was wondering if, like, after decades of development, we still have systems where people are not able to participate in all spaces of um, the economic system. They are becoming increasingly complex. They are becoming increasingly volatile. Um, because you know, while we might treat COVID as an isolated event, there's, of course, a lot of reason to think about the future and you know climate change and all of these different crises that have very different outcomes. So it's a state of not knowing as well. And I wonder what happens if we let go of that need paradigm or think beyond it, right? Because that's the political foundation that underpins targeting. It's trying to identify uh, groups based on need, right? So what happens if we let go of that? What, can we think a bit broader in terms of like, I don't know, I'm kind of pushing this possibly in a bit of James Ferguson's corner and having the rightful share for people and perhaps design systems a bit differently going forward. I think that's the, I think that's the kind of um, point I was trying to stress a little bit. Right. Yeah. 
Thank you. Is there more questions? Please, yes, the lady in the middle there, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for those very good presentations. My name is Karen Kandie from the National Treasury in Kenya. Uh, just some comments. Uh, in your research, did you take into account the sufficiency of uh, social protection? Uh, for instance, in Kenya, what we have is um, some transfer of 2,000 Kenya shillings to persons aged 65 years and above. 2,000 shillings, I have translate for you, that's about $13 per month um, in current exchange rate. Probably six months ago, that would have been $15. It's no enough at all. Uh, so we could say there is social protection, but um, is it really protecting? Because the amount is so little. That's just one meal if I go to McDonald's or somewhere there. Then there was one of the presentations, I don't remember who the presenter was, but they talked about uh, very low social protection for pregnant mothers. I was wondering whether there has been any focus on expectant mothers because I believe that is where it all starts. Um, uh, expectant mother who is not well taken care of, who doesn't eat enough, produces a child that will probably need medical, medical care throughout their lives. Uh, they won't do well in school and the cycle continues. So I don't know whether there has been very specific targeting of expectant mothers. Then there is one of the presentations that spoke about on the number of women in parliament, but I didn't get that point. If you could please elaborate on that, um, what was the impact of having more women in parliament? Uh, what the point? I, I didn't get the point you were making with that, that reference, but I thought it is an interesting reference, uh, especially because women are generally underrepresented uh, in parliament. Thank you. We have space for one short question. There. Okay, I see now two hands. So two short questions and then a quick last round. And then maybe one person gets back to each question so that we make sure every question. Hi, <laughs> thanks a lot for the presentations. Um, so I have a question about the modality of delivery of donor funded social assistance, uh, perhaps uh, for, for Miguel, because you uh, alluded to it in the last point of your presentation, saying that uh, in certain cases, um, donors directed uh, their funding towards project aid uh, because of fear of regime capture. Um, and so basically configurations where the budget is held by external agencies rather than national governments, where um, key decisions about registration, targeting, and delivery are done by these external agencies, does that, have you found some effects on, on, on the outcomes or are there you know, potential effects on, perverse effects on um, capacity building, uh, bad targeting, things like distrust vis-a-vis uh, -vis these, these programs as well. So it's, it's a more political, political economy question about uh, delivery. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Paul Akuma from uh, Uganda, EPRC. Um, mine is a follow-up from uh, the comment from the official from the Kenyan Treasury. Uh, we do have um, a social protection for the elderly in Uganda also, uh, much lower, maybe $5 uh, a month, uh, the amount received. Um, but, uh, and in the context of the study by Yuka uh, and the gentleman from Ethiopia, um, it's little for many reasons. One, of course, resources. Uh, there are not enough resources. Even uh, even the design right now depends mostly on the on the UK government, 
uh, a lot of the funding comes from the UK government. I, probably the Ethiopian one also could be donor driven. The second, it's because also in Africa there are a lot of other systems existing side by side, informal social protection, which you need to take account of and it's big and uh, um, very healthy and uh, uh, does deliver a lot of uh, social protection. Uh, family, uh, ties, friends, uh, like in Uganda, you don't need to pay for your wedding. People will pay for it. Uh, your friends will pay for it. The third uh, and the last is because uh, we are in experimentation stage. You don't want to pump in a lot of money when you don't have systems. Uh, uh, you don't know how it's going to work. You want to put in a little bit of money and see how it's going to work. I guess a lot of African social protection systems are still experimenting, trying to build institutions, and that's why uh, the amount is also small. So I think these studies need to take those, uh, those issues into account, apart from South Africa, where they already have something going on. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, maybe let's start by Miguel, because you also got a specific question specifically directed at you. Yeah. Well, thank you again for, for uh, your question. So uh, let me briefly uh, address the issue of the transfer size that they are not sufficient to, um, to provide coverage. And if you look at the average of, uh, of those uh, programs cover about 30% of labor, net labor income on average, which uh, in my view, also have quite, you know, there is plenty of evidence and we can talk about this, that even these small uh, grants actually have substantial effects in certain areas. So, and, but obviously, obviously the, this kind of, uh, the transfer size is related to the fiscal space that many countries have, no? So if you increase size, you need to have the ability to finance those programs. So, uh, but nevertheless, there is a substantial differences in the transfer size. In cash transfers, there is a small, but then if you look at pensions, I think the transfer is much greater. And also, the value of services, for example, universal health insurance, uh, provide a cost unit that reflects a much greater transfer in monetary terms. So it depends what you are talking about, no? Uh, but in terms of um, the, the political economy, which is uh, also a very important uh, thing that we did, um, I mean, uh, we complemented the, uh, the study, the econometrics and, you know, all the quantitative analysis with also more qualita qualitative approaches to, uh, to understand precisely the political economy dimensions of that. And uh, I interviewed several colleagues in different agencies, trying to understand how choices from moving from you know, bilateral aid or decisions taken at the national level, how that influence or may, um, you know, diverge from the choices by my multilaterals. And very often the main uh, decisions are driven by political factors in donor countries, not in recipient countries, no? Because the constituencies, uh, or you know, you think about many countries are moving towards uh, lower income or low income countries, many of them, frail states or authoritarian regimes. It's very difficult to argue or get support uh, by the population to continue financing those regimes. So obviously there is a political impact on continue financing this, and the choice is to do it through a neutral, you know, between brackets, neutral actor, which is, uh, for example, the World Bank or UNICEF, you know? So um, there are certainly uh, effects in terms of the influence that countries, donor countries can have on, on, on this dialogue. Obviously, the dialogue continues through multilaterals, but obviously multilaterals uh, make certain uh, choices and decisions based on their policy priorities. Uh, and this is also observed in, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular by the way programs have been shaped, you know, by the influence of the World Bank in particular. The World Bank has been incredibly influential, no? So, but what I can tell you from our qualitative analysis is that those choices reflect donor country politics. Yeah, thank you. Um. And Nana Yuka, do you want to take the questions that came regarding your presentation? Okay, thank you. Yeah, the resource uh, allocated for the benefit program is very less, not only in Ethiopia. This is the case for uh, most of the sub-Saharan countries. 
For instance, in a PSNP or PMT program in Ethiopia, uh, an individual who is a client get only 15 kilogram of uh, white rice uh, or uh, wheat flour in a month. So our analysis shows that uh, most of the recipients are in the bottom two quintiles. So even after getting the benefit, most of the I mean, recipients still remain uh, in poverty. So the main use of this uh, program is not reducing poverty rate, but it helps to only minimize poverty gap since it reduces the gap between the bottom income and the poverty, poverty uh, threshold. So when you see also the coverage still less compared to the share of poor in Ethiopia, per the national figure, around 24% of Ethiopians are poor, but the population is now above 100 million, but the total, in total, the benefit covers around 8 million individuals. So not only the amount, even the coverage is lower. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yes, very little to add. I mean, I basically agree on, on what was said. And, and, and so certainly, I mean, the, the amounts are low, and, um, and, and, and then uh, also quite a bit of depends on, on, what, on what one's poverty measure is, because, I mean, the headcount rate that we showed here uh, is not the sort of uh, the best possible uh, measure in, in this context, perhaps. And, and, and that's why, as, as Adnan Koraki pointed out, we also look at the gap. And of course, I mean, one should also look at the squared gap, and uh, and, and and it's absolutely uh, co uh, when it comes to the I mean informal arrangement that's absolutely crucial. Uh, uh, with the kind of data that we have, um, we we don't work on panel panel data, so we don't know. I mean, how the intra uh, inter household transfers react when when. Uh, when, when the incomes decline, but that's an addition, uh, that's an important addition as well to the to the picture. Thanks. Annalena, you wanna say I, some final words? The final verse is a big on, responsibility. On I'll pass that to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll do the final final verse. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I don't think there was a okay. question. Good. I and also there's say. a coffee break, so you can always catch the presenters as they go off stage for more discussion. Uh, thank you very much, first of all, to the presenters uh, for a very interesting session. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here and for, for uh, showing interest with questions and comments, and I hope you carry on discussing. Um, there will be a book coming out next year um, that will be around all these questions. Um, parts of these presentations you will recognize when you then have the book lying on your bed night table and will read it every night, I'm sure. So thank you very much. Uh, have a nice coffee break.